pena. So oh, let's get started. Um, thank you all for coming to this book panel. My name is Catherine Bowers and I will be moderating today. I'm an associate professor at the University of British Columbia and the vice president of the North American Dostoevsky Society. Today we celebrate the publication of Deborah Martinson's book, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, A Reader's Guide, which was published last month by Academic Studies Press. We are grateful to the Harriman Institute for hosting today's panel and to our sponsors, Academic Studies Press and the North American Dostoevsky Society. Deborah Martinson, who passed away in November 2021, was a beloved teacher, valuable mentor, and cherished friend and colleague. She earned her PhD at Columbia, after which she stayed on at her alma mater to hold the positions of Adjunct Associate Professor of Russian and Comparative Literature, Associate Dean of Alumni Education, Columbia College, and faculty member of the Harriman Institute. Deborah was past president of the International Dostoevsky Society and executive secretary of the North American Dostoevsky Society. Her many book publications include her monograph, Surprised by Shame, Dostoevsky's Liars and Narrative Exposure, published in 2003, and important edited volumes such as Literary Journals in Imperial Russia, published in 1998, and Dostoevsky in Context, published in 2016, and co-edited with Olga Mayorova. These works are go-to resources for scholars of 19th century Russia. Although known primarily for expertise as a Dostoevsky scholar, she also did amazing things when she ventured outside of her specialty. For example, in 2016, she received the Donald Barton Johnson Award for best essay published in the Book of Studies that year, Lolita as Petersburg Text. Deborah worked on completing two book manuscripts during the past year. Her reader's guide, the focus of today's panel, builds on her decades of teaching Dostoevsky's novel in the Columbia Corps and teaching others how to teach the novel. The second book, A Very Short Introduction to Dostoevsky, will be published by Oxford University Press. As I mentioned earlier, today we celebrate the publication of her book, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, A Reader's Guide, which was published last month by Academic Studies Press. If you are interested in purchasing the book, ASP has given us a discount code, which is just Dostoevsky, all caps. Um, <laughs> easy to remember. So let's get started. Um, our panel today features scholars who engage closely with Deborah as interlocutors, mentees, and colleagues. Our first speaker is Greta Matzner Gore, Assistant Professor at the University of Southern California. Thank you, Katya. Deborah was one of the world's best teachers of Dostoevsky. I know because I took her course. Her style of teaching was like this book, lucid, succinctly expressed, and profoundly interested in other people's ideas. She had an extraordinary memory for her students' insights, big and small. Every day after class, she used to recreate on paper the discussion we had just had in person and then email it to us. So just think of what this means she remembered in chronological order every single thing that every single one of her students had said and then committed it to writing. I still can't believe she did that. The faith she had in her students was sometimes unnerving. When I came to her office to talk about my ideas for my final paper, she laughed that resounding laugh of hers and said, go work, it's going to be brilliant. I remember becoming quite nervous and thinking, oh my God, she thinks it's gonna be brilliant. I had better make this brilliant. Um, and I'm sure that the paper ended up being better because of this anxiety. Deborah had faith in her students, but she also held them to very high standards. I remember her telling me years later that my book chapter on the adolescent just wasn't as good as my chapter on demons. But it's not your fault, she added. The adolescent just isn't as good as demons. So she didn't let Dostoevsky off the hook either. Deborah taught crime and punishment many times in Columbia's literature humanities course, and her book comes out of years of teaching experience. 
She shared her lecture notes with me and I think every other preceptor from the Slavic department. Um, and I still use them as the basis for my classes on crime and punishment. I've just never been able to improve on them. What's amazing about Deborah, though, is that she could and she did. She was constantly thinking up new ways to present the text to students. Her crime and punishment lecture notes include her classic reading of the novel's shame and guilt dynamics. But by the time she wrote a reader's guide, she had branched out to analyzing other moral emotions too. In the book, she's especially interested in how other characters react morally to Raskolnikov and how those reactions shape our reading experience. Deborah called her book a reader's guide to crime and punishment, but I can't help but thinking of it as a teacher's guide. To my mind, there are three parts of the book that are especially indispensable to teachers. The classroom discussion questions that she poses at the end of chapter one, her convincing and even-handed analysis of the epilogue, and her summary of crime and punishment criticism from like the last 50 odd years, which is yet another testament to how much Deborah cared about other people's ideas. She was utterly incapable of intellectual envy. She once told me that she didn't even understand the emotion. As she put it, why wouldn't you wanna be around people who are smarter than you? You learn so much. We're very lucky to have this book because Deborah revised and edited it after she became ill. She and I got sick around the same time and we talked a lot about how illness sharpens one's priorities. She told me that her priorities were family first, friends second, and work third. We should all be grateful that surrounded as she was by the first and the second, she still had energy to vote, to devote to the third. Thank you. Thank you, Greta. Um, our second speaker is Erica Drennan, term assistant professor at Barnard College. And also um, quickly, I had forgotten to say before, but um, if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A at the base of the webinar screen and we will answer questions after the panel. So Erica, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm so honored to be here to talk about Deborah's book and my experiences with her. I first met Deborah in fall 2009 when I took her course, the same course that Greta took, Dostoevsky and Nabokov. Deborah was an incredible facilitator of seminar discussions. She expertly managed a class that was a mixture of advanced graduate students and undergrads like myself. And as Greta mentioned, after every class, she sent out these unbelievable many paragraph long emails recapping the discussion and knitting together all the different students' comments into a cohesive whole. I saved every email and I've referenced them many times when I teach one of the texts from that course. It is not an exaggeration to say that Deborah's Dostoevsky and Nabokov course changed my life. I decided to develop my term paper into my undergraduate thesis and Deborah agreed to be my advisor. And the experience of writing a thesis with Deborah is what convinced me that I wanted to go to graduate school and pursue a PhD. Deborah will forever be my model of a teacher and an advisor. She was always available to talk about any idea, however far-fetched or half-formed. She read every word I wrote, often many times over. She guided me without imposing her own interpretations, asking probing questions that pushed me to develop and articulate my ideas. My thesis, and many years later, my dissertation would not have been possible without her. When I started teaching literature humanities as a graduate student at Columbia, Deborah shared all of her class notes um, and ideas with me. She was endlessly generous as both a scholar and a teacher, always happy to share her expertise and experiences on everything from teaching Homer's Iliad to Morrison's Song of Solomon. But her teaching of crime and punishment always stuck out. When Deborah gave a lecture on crime and punishment to the Litham instructors in spring 2021, the chair of Litham commented that despite teaching the novel for two decades, she realized she hadn't really understood it until Deborah's talk that day. So Deborah's book is called A Reader's Guide, but as Greta suggested, it's also a teacher's guide. It offers a path through the novel that attends to both the small textual details and big ethical questions, 
a path that Deborah guided her students through and which I have attempted to echo in my own teaching. So I wanna briefly talk about Deborah's discussion of the murder scene in part one and how I think it is particularly useful for teaching. One of the big questions she suggests using for class discussions is, quote, why do most readers root for the murderer protagonist to escape the scene of the crime? This question is key to getting students to think about how Dostoevsky's narration works and their own complicity in the novel. When I taught Crime and Punishment in Lit Hom, I always had a few students, always male students, who thought Raskolnikov was right, that murdering the pawnbroker was a rational and justifiable thing to do. As Deborah explains, Dostoevsky intellectually snares some readers with Raskolnikov's utilitarian justification for murder. More recently, I have been teaching Crime and Punishment as part of Barnard's first year seminar, a similar environment to Lit Hom, where students are not Russian majors and often have not read any Russian literature before. So I was not terribly surprised that none of my Barnard students agreed with Raskolnikov's justifications for murdering a woman. But the students were surprised when I asked them if they had rooted for Raskolnikov to escape in part one. They sheepishly acknowledged that yes, while reading, they wanted him to get away with it. Which brings us to Deborah's question, why? In her analysis of part one in her reader's guide, Deborah brilliantly shows how Dostoevsky quickly moves from Lizaveta's murder to Raskolnikov's escape thus not giving readers time to fully process the murder. She also shows how Dostoevsky's descriptions of Lizaveta's murder and Raskolnikov's escape echo one another, which puts Raskolnikov in her position. Deborah describes narrative, Dostoevsky's narrative strategy here as a kind of emotional contagion. He puts Raskolnikov in Lizaveta's position and then puts the reader in Raskolnikov's position, making us fully invested in his escape. As Deborah shows, we become the murderer's accomplices after the fact. Deborah's careful close reading of the murder scene offers a model for how to guide students through key passages to answer the question that haunts our reading of part one. Why do we root for the murderer to escape? Her approach connects Dostoevsky's language and narrative strategy to the ethical dimensions of the reading experience. It pushes students to consider the novel not just as an aesthetic object distant from themselves, but as a moral universe in which they are implicated. In my own classes, I've used Deborah's approach of foregrounding the reader's role in the novel and extended it by asking students to put Raskolnikov on trial, thus exploring whether and how they should judge the character and what their judgments reveal about them as readers. Deborah's book is an invaluable guide for both readers and teachers. It brings together her deep knowledge and experience of teaching this novel and shares it with new audiences but for me, reading the book feels like traveling back in time to Deborah's classroom in 2009, where for the first time I fell in love with crime and punishment. So, thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, our next speaker is Ronald Meyer, communications manager of the Harriman Institute and adjunct associate professor at Columbia University. And I wanna say thank you also to Ron for helping me organize the panel today. Um, Ron, also you're muted. There you go. Okay, thank you, Katya. Um, it was my privilege, my great privilege, to work with Deborah uh, on, on getting this book into print. But before I start talking about the Crime and Punishment book, I'd like to go back to, to the 90s. Uh, Marcia and I represent the old guard here on this panel. Um, to the 90s uh, and my work with Deborah on other books. Um, the first book that we worked on together was her, um, her incredibly useful and still very up-to-date uh, edited volume of literary journals in Imperial Russia. Uh, I helped Deborah <clears throat> find the publisher. It came out with Cambridge University Press uh, in 1998. And um, um, one of the things that I do um, as a publications editor at Harriman is that I, I commission reviews uh, for the authors to help give them some uh, guidance on how to make a, a good book or dissertation into a better publishable manuscript. I just started working with Erica Drennan on this very same project. Um, in any case, um, the, the Literary Journals volume was the first and then Surprised by Shame, um, which 
I recently went back and looked at it again, and it's just such an incredible book. Um, again, um, I helped edit a few chapters, but Deborah's very was always a great writer. So um, there are usually minor things, or maybe you could expand this, you know, something like that. Um, um, but you know, so I, I commissioned reviews. She already had good leads on a publisher. It got published in a, in a very prestigious series at the Ohio State University Press. And it came out in um, 2003. Um, and I, um, I have an inscribed copy, uh, which means a lot to me. Uh, as, as always, Deborah is economic, uh, with, economical with her words. The inscription reads, for Ron, invaluable friend, Deborah. So, um, but I have to say that our, our editor author relationship wasn't one sided. Um, starting in the late 90s, and actually starting in the early 2000s, I was translating a collection of Dostoevsky stories from Penguin, a half, a half dozen. And Deborah and I had several long conversations uh, about how to frame the introduction. What to, be, what to be on the lookout for when I was translating important key words in some of the stories. Uh, I remember in particular talking at length about the meek one, for instance, and, um, and also recommending secondary literature that would, would help me with my introduction. Um, it, was, it was really an incredible um, give and take, uh, several sessions. Um, Deborah also pushed me um, a little bit on the way, on the path of becoming a Dostoevsky scholar. I was started to get interested in in Dostoevsky and adaptations, and she said, "You must deliver a paper at um, the conference in Naples." Um, I've never delivered a, a paper on Dostoevsky anywhere. Naples seemed to be a good place to start, um, but it was all thanks to Deborah. Um, and eventually that work, and I continued working on film and adaptations of Dostoevsky, um, led to an, an article about adaptations of Dostoevsky's White Nights. Um, so um, um, so it, it, it was an important step in, in this whole process. And finally, an anecdote that I've told to many people, um, when I started to teach the 19th century prose class uh, at Columbia in the, in the 90s, before it got revamped to literature and empire, I was told that under no circumstances could I teach crime and punishment because Bob Belknap taught that. And so I would teach notes from underground or whatever. And um, Deborah and I were up for lunch, or I forget exactly how it happened. I complained to her about that. I said, I really want to teach crime and punishment. And she says, I can't believe Bob wouldn't encourage you to teach the book. I don't, you know, I'm sure that no one has asked him. They just assume that you shouldn't do this. She said, go ask Bob. And Bob Belknap responded with, Ron, I think everyone should teach crime and punishment at every opportunity. You and I are not going to do it the same. Um, I love teaching crime and punishment. You know? And so um, in February uh, of last year, 2021, when she wrote me that she was undergoing cancer treatment and that she needed help, that um, perhaps uh, time was not on her side in this endeavor, um, I was only too happy to, to um, dig back into crime and punishment. Um, originally, Deborah had, had begun the manuscript for another publisher, um, but they weren't happy with her chronological approach. Um, but I think that um, as, as we talked uh, about it and as you talked with others about it, with her emphasis on narrative strategy, and that's precisely what she was emphasizing in her book proposal, uh, with her emphasis on narrative strategy, the chronological approach allows you to follow how Dostoevsky does this, uh, whereas the thematic approach, approach is going to be too much toing and froing. 
Um, so narratives, narrative strategy, psychology, and ideology. Those are the things that she um, thought would be the center of, of her book. We decided from the outset that I would take care of you know, the administrative drudge work and she would concentrate on the writing. So I helped, I helped her, um, she had written a proposal. I did the drudge work of filling out the proposal form for the publisher. Um, 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 we've, we've found a publisher, Academic Studies Press. Um, they decided very quickly, uh, both on the merit of, of this project and, and the fact, I think, that Deborah and I were both known quantities. I had just published with them and, um, and Deborah had published uh, with them both as a, uh, a chapter author and as an editor of the book, um, uh, honoring Bob Bellman. Um, in any case, the, the book, the writing was virtually complete, but what she wanted to do was to take the notes that she received from her friends and incorporate those and later academic studies uh, press also commissioned reviews and she wanted to in incorporate um, those suggestions. So while she was doing that, and of course I was also reading and, and, and um, other people were reading uh, and giving feedback. Um, so while she was concentrating on that, on that, I was hiring an index. Um, we worked on the copy edits together. Um, we uh, contacted the Dostoevsky Museum in Petersburg for the cover image. Um, and, um, and the book, you know, just, it was published almost exactly a year after we first approached Academic Studies Press. Um, and those in academic publishing know how, how quickly that is. <laughs> um, we, Deborah and I went through the copy edits together. Um, later, um, Marsha Morris and I read the final proofs. Deborah's energy was, was, was waning, um, but she was able, she, um, she and friends and uh, her husband, Randy, were able to choose the cover uh, image for the, um, for the book. And um, Academic Studies Press really went out to get the cover to Deborah early so that um, she could see it, uh, approve it. Uh, I think there was one small suggestion. And I know there's a photograph of Deborah holding um, her laptop with, with the cover of, of the book on the laptop. And so, um, so I think, I think that um, is where I'll end. Um, it's very hard to talk without getting too emotional. So I will pass it on back to Katya. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Um, okay, uh, our next speaker is Marsha Morris, Professor Emerita of Georgetown University. Thanks, Katya. Um, I'd like to begin, first of all, by thanking all of those who helped put together today's event. It's, it's such a great joy to be with you to celebrate the appearance of Deborah's book, even at the same time that it's a great sadness to be doing it without Deborah herself. She would really have loved this. I'd particularly like to acknowledge Ron for everything he did to ensure that the book came out as beautifully and expeditiously as it did. His timely interventions ensured Deborah's peace of mind. She knew that the book was coming and she even knew exactly what it would look like. Um, Ron has just been characteristically modest in describing his part in handling um, the details of the publication process. Um, he undertook the job of liaising with Academic Study Press, answering any and all queries that came up during the production process. Um, Greater love hath no man than this. Deborah and I first met at Columbia over 40 years ago in 1980. I was a newbie, but she'd already been in the department for a year or two and knew all the ropes. It was an odd kind of semester. Quite a few of the regular faculty were away on one kind of leave or another. And a disproportionate number of the classes offered were in linguistics. 
Deborah and I stuck together like glue throughout history of Russian and structure of Russian. Aside from holding one another's metaphorical hands through the oral exams in each class, we came to bond over more personal things too, including the shared vagaries of Catholic upbringings that we both ultimately drifted away from to the extent that one ever can do that. And we swam together, always we swam. Our interests and temperaments were quite different, but over the years we grew ever closer. We took classes together, studied for written comps together, prepared for orals together. But somehow, no matter how long I had been at Columbia, Deborah still always seemed to know the ropes better. This would normally have been seriously vexing to me, but Deborah was so incredibly generous that she saved me from feeding my subterranean inner churl. I particularly remember the moment when it came time for us to prepare for the written comps. Deborah arrived in the reading room on the seventh floor of Hamilton Hall one day with notebook and pen in hand and announced that we would be drawing up a schedule. To wit, we would divide the material into sections, decide which sections each of us would be responsible for, allocate a certain amount of time for each section and meet once a week to swap information. For my part, I explained rather carefully that I was a solo flyer and I planned to prepare entirely on my own. Deborah Counter responded that it would make the most sense to begin with old Russian literature, which I would be responsible for and move on to the 18th century, which she would prepare. She then apportioned one brief week of preparation to the 700 years in question. I tried again to explain that this wasn't really how I worked and that I was best left to my own devices. Meanwhile, Deborah had already divided the 19th century up into individual authors, allocated half of them to me, the other half to herself, your Tolstoy, as she always said, versus my Dostoevsky. I'm generally a little slow on the uptake, but eventually it percolated through to me that my protests were futile. I was going to have to give in and work in tandem with Deborah. I now know that if I hadn't figured that out at the time, I would probably still be preparing for exams 40 years later. As it was, Deborah marched us both through the exam so handily that it barely hurt at all. I ended up by moving to DC before Deborah began to teach. So I never had the opportunity to see her in Columbia's classrooms, but her instincts were always directed towards teaching. A year or so before I left, I was scheduled to present my dissertation brief. My baby sitter fell ill at the last minute and I had no idea what to do with my son, David, who must have been around a year old or so. Deborah, of course, took him in hand. And by the time I was finished, David had learned how to drink through a straw. Deborah thought that every baby should have this indispensable skill and she wasted no time in imparting it. Her cardinal rule was never to waste a good teaching moment. Over the course of 20 years, Deborah would come stay with me for a week or so each summer at my dacha in Maine on Matinicus Island. The first time she came, I warned her that Matinicus was a rogue pirate island, that she should buy some ratty clothes at a thrift shop to wear while visiting, and that we were going to be reduced to dry goods rather than fresh fruit and vegetables. I also warned her that we had only four ferries per month and that she should make sure to get on the right boat, since otherwise she'd end up on the wrong island with no options for making it to Matinicus. Needless to say, the fine folks at the ferry service put her on the wrong boat, even though she had questioned them closely, so that while I was waiting for her at the wharf on Matinicus, she was wandering around Vinyl Haven. The Matinicus postmaster sauntered up to me to ask whether I was waiting for a guest from down south. If so, she would be arriving by chartered plane. A half hour later, Deborah stepped smartly out of a tiny four-seater dressed as impeccably and gorgeously as usual. She had wrestled with the Vinyl Haven residents until they'd helped her to charter a plane. It took her a year, but she managed to make the Maine State Ferry Service reimburse her for that charter, a rare, rare example of fighting City Hall and actually winning. I'm firmly convinced that there's absolutely nothing that Deborah couldn't have managed. Comps, drinking straws, ferry services. She was a master of them all as well as of so much more. I'd like to talk about Deborah's book from the perspective of a Dostoevsky outsider. 
as I said, our scholarly interests were always quite different and I'm no expert on crime and punishment, but I did teach it on more than one occasion before I retired. And I only wish that I could have had her marvelous book in my hands as I prepared. My students would have had an infinitely richer experience. Deborah has always gone deep where I tend to go broad. She understands her material in profound and enlightening ways. More important, she knows exactly how to contextualize her understanding in ways that are maximally helpful to others. It follows that the opening line of Dostoevsky's crime and punishment compresses a world of information into a mere handful of elegant words. Quote, crime and punishment is a psychological detective novel whose mystery lies not in the who done it, but in the why done it. This one concise formulation compresses information that a left, less gifted scholar would take an entire page to explain. How Dostoevsky writes literary fiction while relying on many of the conventions of genre fiction. How he bends borrowed conventions in ways that make them deeply Russian and that will create a unique roadmap for future works of Russian genre fiction. How he brings the full force of morality and ethics to bear on his material. All this in a one short sentence. The book's first paragraph is as remarkable as its first sentence, raising issues of genre, temporal and social context, ideology and axiology. Again, so much in so little space. And so it goes with the introductory chapter as a whole. One could teach crime and punishment beautifully from this chapter alone, although it would be criminal not to follow Deborah through all five of her chapters. The book is defined by its elegance and coherence. I can't begin to imagine how Deborah managed it, given the rigor of her medical treatments and the limited time that she had in which to complete her work. But then she always had a consummate talent for managing the unmanageable and for bringing all of us along with her as well. She was my great good friend and I miss her every single day. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Um, our next speaker is Kate Hollins. Uh, Kate is, the, is an associate professor at the University of Toronto and the president of the North American Dostoevsky Society. Thank you. And thanks, Marcia. That was, that was wonderful. It's a really hard talk to follow. It was, there was just so much there. Um, uh, I first met Deborah in 1999 when I was a graduate student at Yale under the supervision of Robert Louis Jackson. And he organized a conference on the Brothers Karamazov on the eve of his retirement that featured many wonderful Dostoevsky scholars and friends of his. Deborah was riding high in Dostoevsky circles at the time after the wonderful IDS conference um, of 1998 in New York City, which was shortly before my arrival in the United States, but about which I heard a lot from Robert and others that first fall. I had known Deborah from her wonderful book that's been mentioned several times already, Literary Journals in Imperial Russia, uh, which was a key source for the senior thesis that I wrote at Cambridge uh, on Dostoevsky as a writer's diary. I've always loved that book and the insights it gives into literary institutions and their culture. I was very excited to meet Deborah's and others who'd work I'd read at that conference. Um, and it was where I gave my first conference paper. Deborah was really kind and complimentary and I found myself talking to her a lot at the conference dinner. And of course, like so many other uh, younger scholars, um, I had the experience that she introduced me to so many people um, in these kinds of conference uh, contexts. Um, I also remember interacting with her at my first IDS conference in Baden-Baden, which was in October 2001. Um, so that was a very strange time to be traveling. It was shortly after 9-11, and it felt really strange to be crossing the Atlantic for a conference after planes had been grounded for weeks. Um, it was a trip that could have been very alienating. I could only afford to stay in the youth hostel in a room which I shared with lots of other people, and my jet lag was, um, was quite bad. Um, but Deborah was warm and welcoming and she introduced me to many, many scholars and colleagues from all over the world and it ended up actually being an unfor unforgettable trip and an island of normalcy in a very strange few years. And so to skip forward several years, um, 
at which I saw Deborah at conferences where she was unfailingly friendly and brilliant and helpful. I came to interact with her, as so many of us have, as reader of my book manuscript for Northwestern University Press. She was an incredibly generous uh, reader and interlocutor, and she went far, far beyond the level of expectation for a manuscript reader. As you all know, and um, Ron has already mentioned this, um, her editorial skills were second to none. And if you re if she read your manuscript, you got a line by line reading and many, many editorial select suggestions that were incredibly wise, helpful, sensible and insightful, basically a professional editing job that you uh, got from the press for free. Um, and I remember that she pointed out my tendency to write in the passive voice and my fondness for ridiculously long sentences. Um, and with her help, I was able to vastly improve the writing of my book and get it out in time for tenure. And actually, every time I try to write a passive, I always think about Deborah and, you know, try to reframe it um, uh, uh, act as an active uh, verb. And I know that um, in terms of the tenure, I know that many of very many of us are in the same boat, that we're tenured in part thanks to Deborah's, Deborah's careful reading of our manuscripts. Um, more recently, she was the reader for a Canadian Slavonic Papers for um, uh, uh, an, edited, uh, an edited volume cluster um, for my uh, with articles by me, Katja, um, and Eric Nyman. And she gave really rich suggestions for improvements of our articles. And I think that cluster also uh, bears her marks. And Deborah's careful engagement with other scholars' work can be seen everywhere in the field, and it's enriched our work and hers. And it also provided a background for the volumes that she edited, as well as a variety of pedagogical resources for which our field must be eternally grateful. Um, Dostoevsky in, in Context, a wonderful and encyclopedic volume that she co-edited with Olga Mayorova for Cambridge University Press, contains multitudes of rich scholarship and information that's invaluable for anyone teaching not just Dostoevsky but 19th century Russian prose in general and as part of the lead up to the volume uh, Deborah and Olga organized a wonderful conference in Colombia that was attended by many of the contributors uh, including myself and I came with my husband and with a toddler in tow uh, my first uh, son was about one and a half at the time and I was you know I was kind of embarrassed to be bringing a kid um, to uh, an academic conference but Deborah and Olga were both extremely uh, curious and generous and asked me all about um, the kid and my family and so on and that was wonderful. Um, and that volume's conception, um, as well as the process of dialogue and feedback that was formidably planned by Deborah and Olga, created a back and forth that shaped the volume as an erudite and multifaceted conversation taking place over time. The volume is full of Deborah's generous personality and collegiality, as is the current volume, her reader's guide to crime and punishment that we're talking about today. But before I get to that, to the reader's guide, I did want to say a few words about Deborah's involvement in the international and North American Dostoevsky societies. As someone pointed out uh, on Sunday at Deborah's memorial, to see her at the IDS conference was to see her in her element as an intellectual celebrity and a colleague on the inside of both societies. It was a great honor to be asked by Deborah and Carol to first join the board of the North American Dostoevsky Society and then to become president at, and to inherit the great foundations built by Deborah in particular. Deborah's collegiality is the rich soil in which both organizations have developed in the past 20 years and more. And this volume too bears the marks of Deborah's lifelong engagement with scholars from all over the world. Posthumously published, it provides a kind of synthesis of Deborah's teaching, about which we've already heard much today already, of her scholarship and of her conversations with others about Dostoevsky's most famous novel. The bibliography reads as a list of the intellectual community and the relationships supported by and through the International and North American Dostoevsky Societies, as well as in harmony with Deborah's rich contributions to the field. It's exhaustive, it's generous, and it's erudite, just like Deborah's scholarship and like Deborah herself. Reading the Reader's Guide for today's panel, I was struck by its stylistic economy combined with its intellectual plenitude. 
I'm um, just like Marcia said with that first sentence, she could fit so much into just such a small space. Um, it deals with the ideological, narratological, historical, cultural and philosophical underpinnings of Dostoevsky's text, but in a remarkably elegant way, revealing its dense meaning making structures and the ways in which Dostoevsky manipulates the reader. Deborah is a particularly astute reader of Dostoevsky's manipulation strategies and her reading of the ways in which he describes the two murder scenes and conflates the feelings of Lizaveta and Raskolnikov in the second murder. By the way, that's often a murder that's ignored by those who teach and those who work on Dostoevsky, right? Everybody remembers the murder of Alyona Ivanovna, but often Lizaveta's murder is less emphasized. And in this reading, uh, it's very much at the fore. Um, and the way in which she shows how the uh, Dostoevsky conflates the feelings of Lizaveta and Raskolnikov in the second murder reveals one of the deepest and most effective dynamics by which uh, he makes his philosophical argument within the novel. Also really powerfully expressed here is the difference between guilt and shame, an area in which, of course, uh, Deb Deborah extensively analyzed in her wonderful book, Surprised by Shame, Dostoevsky's Liars and Narrative Exposure, uh, which came out with Ohio University Press. And I was reminded of the guilt and shame dynamic recently when speaking to a Russian colleague about the invasion of Ukraine, and she described her response to those events as one not of guilt, but of shame. Um, shame is key to crime and punishment in Deborah's reading. She analyzes the dream Raskolnikov has following his return from his first meeting with Porfiry Petrovich in part three and his revelation of being a louse. He dreams of killing her over, over again and Deborah argues that it's a dream of shame. Quote, shame is emotionally difficult to witness, both in real life and on the page. This dream contains shame's essential components, exposure, painful self-consciousness, desire to flee, paralysis. The, the pain of shame aroused stems from a sense of being exposed that triggers a person's feelings of inferiority, inadequacy, defectiveness or exclusion. And, unquote. and this then triggers a response of flight and or paralysis. Deborah examines how shame is the key to Raskolnikov's situation following the murders. She argues, quote, his crime did not fail literally but figuratively. In killing two women, he killed his dream of greatness, unquote. Deborah's reading of the novel through the lens of shame allows her to pay particular attention also to its gender dynamics and in the public shaming of the most disempowered character in the novel, Sonia. The false equivalence of Raskolnikov's and Sonia's shame helps Dostoevsky reveal in Deborah's reading the lack in Raskolnikov, the failure to experience guilt, which leads to his suffering in Siberia and his failure to find any kind of release until the very end of the second part of the epilogue. Deborah's reading of Crime and Punishment analyzes and explains Raskolnikov's idea, the plot of the murder and its aftermath, all the big things that, of course, we always talk about with Crime and Punishment. But it also places the great man theory into a broader, more generous framework in which we see the world's complex power dynamics at work and are invited to remember the most disempowered women in the novel, Sonia and Lizaveta, and the values they represent, and find within Dostoevsky's most well-known novel, a kind kinder and more humane vision of the world, one which all of those who knew Deborah can recognize. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, um, and thank you, everyone. So if you have questions, go ahead and pop them in the Q&A um, at the bottom. And we will, in the meantime, um, have a little discussion. I, I see that Olga Mirson has shared a memory in the chat, um, which I would like to read out. Um, and in the meantime, as I said, if you have questions, please pop them in the chat. Um, both Ron and Marsha have commanded my undivided attention. Deborah was the one who introduced me to both and turned our friendships into lifelong collaborations and collegiality. The touchstones of our Columbia gang, see Bob Belknap, where Bob Belknap himself and Deborah, and they have ignited in us the spirit of collegiality, which is not extinguished even in these horrible times. By the way, when Deborah introduced me to Marsha on the seventh floor of Hamilton, she had Marsha's firstborn on her, Deborah's hip. 
Throughout my child rearing, for all three, we were together, neighbors, colleagues, fellow mothers, patient arguers, each other's editors in Russian and English mutually. We were inexpressibly close, but I also owe her with my youngest child. She nursed me as I nursed him. And throughout all those times, we never stopped discovering new things about Dostoevsky, comparing and contrasting notes. Our two articles on the private Kolpakov were written in parallel as she analyzed uh, the passage from the psychological point of view, I addressed its absurdity and absurdly and powerfully Christian message. The ravings of the drunken Evolgen had a point. If the one who dies because of you turns up alive, you are no longer guilty. The only factual precedent this juridical case ever ha has ever has was Christ's resurre resurrection freeing us from guilt. We worked in the far right, we worked in the right side park path of the Fort Tryon Park while watching our kids. The moment we were done with our articles, she immediately edited my English and I her renderings of the Russian quotes. With her, neither of us knew who owed whom more. I feel infinite gratitude to her, both for where I could give back and where I could not in so many ways. Dearest Pshoka, the meaning of Deborah in Hebrew, which I have, have always called you, speaking and writing to you, looking forward to seeing you in eternal bliss and hope that your intercession will get me there. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, thank you all so much for sharing your memories, um, your thoughts about this book. Uh, one thing that really struck me as I was reading through this book was um, precisely what Kate said, the way it feels like in reading it, yes, it's a good guide to reading the novel. Um, yes, it's a good guide to teaching the novel, but it's also a good guide to the scholarship around the novel and those dialogues that Deborah was so much a part of. Um, I know in my own work, um, my relationship with Deborah started rather later than everyone else's. I first met Deborah at a conference on crime and punishment that we had in 2016, Kate and I. Um, and Deborah had just started reading my work. So um, we had begun those conversations and she did give me line by line edits unexpectedly on my book manuscript, um, which uh, I was glad to be able to speak to her about. She accidentally left uh, her name on one of the anonymous edits in the document. So I knew it was her, um, but she, uh, my book is coming out next month with <laughs> massive gratitude to Deborah. Um, and uh, that kind of intellectual community that comes up through the reading of this book, it's its really vibrant. Like I was really struck by a lot of the different references that she had in there. Everything from books that she knew were forthcoming to blog posts that she knew existed to uh, she has, uh, for example, Sarah Young's map of the locations of crime and punishment from Sarah Young's mapping Petersburg site, right? There's a lot of different things there. And I, I was wondering um, for the panelists, what are the things that struck you as being the most kind of Deborah things to include in this book? I think, um, you know, when you mentioned the map, um, I'm going back now to mm, 1999, I think, possibly. Um, and Deborah was in Moscow briefly um, meeting with various um, of, of her colleagues um, in Dostoevsky studies and um, staying with my husband, who was working at the American embassy at the time. And she was all over the place with maps. You know, you, you can't understand how a thing happens unless you know where it happened. If you don't get the space, then you're left entirely with time and that impoverishes your reading and so on. So the, the kinds of things that to be quite honest never occurred to me um, were, are deeply characteristic of her work. She just looked at every corner. Uh, to, to that, I would add uh, the chronology of the novel that she has at the end. Um, you know, it's not just day by day, it's hour by hour. Yeah, it's incredibly uh, detailed. And it's, it's incredibly detailed um, and, you know, incredibly useful. Because, mm -hmm. you know, again, because of the, of the way that Dostoevsky draws us into the narrative, 
we sort of lose our bearings at, at how long things take. Um, and, you know, when you have that, um, uh, that chronology, uh, it really helps you put things into perspective. Um, and I mean, Marsh is absolutely right about the maps. I mean, that was the, the first thing that we talked about with images is we need a couple of good maps. Um, she didn't really care if we had pictures of Dostoevsky himself, um, you know, they can find that anywhere. Um, but you know, the maps so that you can, you can follow where he's walking. I was going to also say the chronology where I think it's first of all, just an unbelievable resource, but it reminded me when I first saw that that was there of all of the time I spent with her. Uh, my undergraduate thesis was focused mostly on Lolita and we spent so much time talking about and looking at chronologies of that novel and sort of, she was so keyed into these kind of really sort of looking in detail at all of um, the time as well as the space as people are mentioning with the maps. And so seeing that it really kind of recalled how she really engaged with and thought about both this novel, but also others too. And for me, um, it's one of the most Deborah things about the book is the um, appendix, which details, you know, so much scholarship about the novel, um, recent and pretty distant. And what to me is so um, revealing about it and wonderful about it is that it she doesn't just, you know, create a bibliography, which one could do. She really writes down every single person's thesis and correctly. Um, and that's not, you know, it, it seems like it should be easy to re uh, record somebody's thesis, but, but it isn't necessarily, right? She really has, um, not only knows the scholarship, but she knows the scholarship um, in such a way that she can reveal it to other people so that they can understand it better. I hope that made sense. No, definitely. Um, as I was reading through that, I <laughs> I know some of the people definitely had Deborah as an interlocutor as they were working on the things there. And I was wondering just how many of them Deborah helped get to that thesis, um, which yeah, is really striking. And I, I also deeply appreciate that a lot of the things that we notice about the book that are kind of the most Deborah stamps on it are the appendix, the maps, the, the the things that seem like ephemera, but here they're so deliberate and they're so useful for teaching and reading and understanding crime and punishment. And and I would just add um, um, in the main part, sort of a way I agree with everything that everybody said, but also the way in which the book is so um, it, 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 so concrete and so well organized. So um, it's the kind of thing where I don't know. I'm, everyone who who teaches must have had the experience when you're kind of scrambling before your lecture, and you know that the, there's a book that might be able to help you, but you know you've got this like 350 pages, and you only have five minutes, and you've got to get into that book and find exactly where is the section that's going to help you with this lecture. Um, and this book is organized in such a way that there will be no problems in in the five minutes in finding exactly what you need. Um, and just the sort of the concrete and but yet very erudite way in which she manages to pack so much in a very organized way into such a um, short, small amount of space, I would say. I really appreciated at the very beginning of the book where she says, okay, so we're going to close read the first six paragraphs. And if you're teaching this book and your students have read part one of the novel, all you really need to do is close read these six paragraphs with them and then ask them these questions about the murder scene. And that's your class. And I was like, yes, yes, Deborah. <laughs> I, I wish I had had this knowledge, what, two months ago when I was teaching the first part of Crime and Punishment, um, because we jumped right to the murder and those six paragraphs would have been really helpful to close read at the beginning. Um, exactly, exactly. So I think I, we may have already answered this question, but a question that I also wanted to ask was, what do we think what do we think for a reader of crime and punishment, not necessarily a teacher of crime and punishment, but for a reader of crime and, crime and punishment, what is the most valuable part of this book? I think um, 
as has already been discussed, the whole shame and guilt dynamic um, is particularly helpful when you come to the epilogue. Um, I'm famously, and I'm shocked to say this in front of all of you, I, I don't like crime and punishment. I just don't like it. It doesn't mean that I don't recognize it at, for what it is. Um, it's a marvelous novel. It's, oops, pardon me. Um, it's just not a favorite. And the um, epilogue just makes everything that much harder. And suddenly when I read Deborah's take on it, I said, oh my God, you know, it's not strained. It's not um, attempting to force me into something I don't want to agree with. It works, you know? So um, that helped me personally a lot. I think as well, um, some of those, the couple beginning chapters, like the overview of the history and the ideology. I mean, she does it in, you know, really just a few pages, which, you know, so many people um, go on and on and on. And if you're, you know, the supposed general reader, you probably don't need to know all those details. You need to know that it's a Petersburg text. What does that mean? You know, one, two, three. And, you know, I, and I think that precisely because she is so economical in her writing that, and, and understandable. I mean, she doesn't, you, she doesn't shy from theory, but she, she's very careful to explain the theory in, in terms that make sense to, um, to, again, to the general reader. And I think, you know, those couple of things really make this, you know, a reader's guide. Um, okay. I think also, I would oh, you go ahead. Okay, quickly, I was just gonna say, I think also her attention to the the reader's experience throughout that sort of that is a through line that I think any reader in a classroom or not can really hold on to to make sense of kind of why they're sort of feeling as they do or being sucked in in certain ways and what that means and how that that's working. I think it it can be really helpful for any reader to kind of get that sort of understanding of their own experience. To add to that, Olga Merson has written a comment, which is for the reader, what matters is that the it's that Deborah makes us feel we cannot get off the hook of Raskolnikov's view and stance as morally safe outsiders, which adds on to that. And I would also, I would say that the, her analysis of the dreams um, is sort of, again, succinct, but very, very clear and mm -hmm. useful and helpful to the general reader, I think. Yeah, I appreciate very much her differentiation of the dreams, right? The different dream types and the kind of meaning of them within the fabric of the novel. So basically, we can all agree that it's the whole book. <laughs> yeah. the, the book, the book, I don't know if you all can see this. It's concise. It's, I mean, of course, it's concise. Deborah wrote it, right? It's concise, but it's kind of perfect in terms of exactly what's included is what needs to be included. Every word is valuable. Um, so we have a question from Bianca Calabresi, which is, um, what is Dr. Martinson's reading in her book on, or how do those on the panel view, oh boy, the difficulty of analyzing the epilogue with the way in which it contrasts or even possibly contradicts with the Raskolnikov of the main novel itself, in particular, his lack of repentance prior to it? Is his development as a character here believable? Um, and she apologizes for how specific this question might be. Um, so I, I think I agree with Marcia that the um, Deborah's interpretation of the epilogue is one of my favorite parts of the book. Um, and what I really love about it is that she prepares us, she's sort of preparing her interpretation of the epilogue throughout her entire analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so as she, I, part of her argument is that the epilogue there are these sort of moments of almost conversion that happen throughout the novel, where she particularly talks about the moments when Raskolnikov's heart is softened. Um, and those moments when he mentions, thinks about Lizaveta, and the moment when he sees Sonia 
as Lizaveta, these moments where um, Raskolnikov is preparing and also Dostoevsky is preparing the reader for the eventual, eventual almost conversion at the end. Um, And yeah, and I would agree um, that that it's a kind of test. Um, and this is something that I think all of us who teach um, crime and punishment, you know, we we do come uh, directly up against this question of what to make of the epilogue. Um, and um, Katya and I and Eric Nyman recently had a, a cluster article cluster on this question. And I think I, d I don't want to go into too much detail, but I think the question of sort of that this is another test for the reader and um, that if we've read carefully enough, then we can kind of see ways in which Dostoevsky has prepared um, us for what happens at the end of the novel and that actually it doesn't really come out of the blue. But at the same time, it's also a, a, um, a, a, even the very end of the novel that seems to be so so conclusive also offers a few hints that 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 for, for some kind of an alternative way of reading it, too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what, what I appreciated about the book a great deal is that Deborah laid out her reading of the epilogue, which fits so well with everything that she wrote in the book, like her book leads up to it, as you said, um, Greta, but then also in the scholarship section, she added a bunch of other readings of the epilogue, including mine and Kate's and other people's, and she was like, these are other interpretations of the epilogue, they're okay, like, you can, you can make of them what you will, I'm like, yes, that's fine. Um, the epilogue remains a, a tricky teaching point, um, but I really appreciated the, uh, yeah, I really appreciated the way that she put it in, in the book. And I hope that's answered Bianca's question. Um, we do not really have any other questions um, and we are bumping up against our time, I see as well. So if there aren't any more questions, um, I would just like to say, um, well, there is a discount code, Dostoevsky, easy to remember, all caps, if you would like to get 25% off Deborah's book. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers. Does anyone have any last things they would like to say today? The one thing I would like to say is to express my gratitude to Deborah for writing this book, which I really, really appreciate. Nancy Workman asks, will the recording be accessible to people who missed the talk? Um, yes, it is being live streamed now. And yes, the recording will be available on the event page at the Harriman Institute and also on the North American Dostoevsky Society YouTube channel after the talk. Does anyone else have anything they would like to share? I've interrupted us. Just to just to thank everybody, and especially those who uh, have known Le Deborah for the longest and have known her um, in this with the greatest concentration. In other words, uh, her former students too. So thanks so much for um, for participating. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you to everyone for coming, for sharing memories, for sharing questions, um, and for taking time to think through Deborah's book. All right, thank you all. Um, 